for you. First of all, I always do this little uh, quiz. Is there anyone who is visiting the Hebrew Union College's historic Cincinnati campus for the first time who's in the room? Is there anyone? Well, welcome. Very glad to have you. You're our honored guest. Don't, let, don't be strangers. Come back. And uh, I want to introduce everybody to our dean, Dean Jonathan Hecht, who's back there. And uh, so uh, let me, on behalf of our dean and behalf of our faculty, welcome everyone to our campus and, of course, to the Jacob Rader Marcus Center of the American Jewish Archives. Now, uh, a few people have said to me uh, out in the reception how wonderful it is that I was able to procure the appearance of Professor Mnookin here in Cincinnati. And I did have to pause for a few minutes so that I could take credit for something that I didn't do. <laughs> but being that I'm here at the Hebrew Union College, I eventually returned to my moral bearings. And I had to concede and confess that the only wisdom that I had was to be able to say yes to a wonderful offer that came to me from our friend Paul Sittenfeld. Paul, who I hope you all know, is a wonderful friend of our communities, very active in so many wonderful uh, endeavors here in Cincinnati, and has been a friend of the College Institute ever since, uh, well, I can say for sure, since the late 70s. And the reason I know that is because when I was a second year student, the overseers were taking new students who are just coming to the Cincinnati community from out of town and showing them hospitality so they would adjust to Cincinnati. And Steffi and I were invited to the Sittenfelds home. That's when I first met Paul. And I liked it so much that I've stayed all these years. There you are. So uh, Paul uh, was nice enough to say that his first cousin was Bob Manukin. I had just finished reading in the Times the review of this wonderful book that has just appeared. And it was Paul who said, uh, would the American Jewish Archives be interested in hosting uh, Bob here to speak about his book, maybe to sign some books and so forth? So I do want to take credit for having been wise enough to say, sure, great, that would be terrific. And uh, I do want to also thank, before we begin and before I turn the introduction over to Paul. I do want to thank um, all of those folks from the American Jewish Archives. I don't see them all here, but uh, I think everybody in this room knows that a program like this and all the effort that goes into organizing it uh, doesn't just happen. And we have so many devoted staff members and colleagues here at the American Jewish Archives who work so hard to provide for these programs. Uh, in a little bit, after Professor Manukin, we're going to have a response from a person who probably doesn't need an introduction uh, in this group, and that is the uh, current interim uh, president of the Hebrew Union College, the past president and chancellor, now Chancellor Emeritus of the Hebrew Union College. He's got, what, four or five more days, David? Is that it? Uh, that's why Six, but who's counting? Who's counting? There you go. So uh, uh, I, uh, I'm really honored, David, so honored that uh, in this very busy last week uh, that you've been able to join us for this program as well. And we're looking forward to hearing your response to Professor Manukin in a little bit. So with having that uh, said, I do want to welcome the man who really made this uh, program possible today to introduce our speaker, uh, Paul Sittenfeld. Let me echo Rabbi Zola's thanks to the college, to the archives, and all the people who extended such a warm and welcoming hospitality. Gary and I have known each other through many years, but he obviously does not know me well enough, or he would not have taken the generous, if unwise, risk of allowing me to introduce Professor Manukin and Rabbi Ellenson. Either or both of those gentlemen could have warned him, but the die is cast. As we all know, cousins can be claimed or not as we wish. One can take them or leave them. 
Friends are completely optional. In this case, I claim both as friends with genuine affection and admiration. Robert Manukin has had and continues to have an impressive and meaningful career. A graduate of Harvard University and Harvard Law School, a Fulbright Scholar, a clerk on the United States Supreme Court, a distinguished law school faculty member at the University of California at Berkeley, at Stanford, and for more than two decades at Harvard. His greatest contribution, at least to all of our shared extended family, is that he married Dale more than 50 years ago. Dale, who's happily with us this evening. Together, they're the proud parents of two most accomplished daughters, two splendid sons-in-law, and four grandchildren. As noted, Bob is my first cousin, but if that isn't even enough, he and I grew up in the same house in Kansas City, in a duplex with his parents on the first floor and mine on the second floor. As a consequence of tight housing throughout the country after World War II, our fathers and mothers purchased this home for what they anticipated to be one year. Actually, we remained under the same roof for 20 years, so we know each other somewhat more than well. Further, Bob and Dale have been extraordinarily hospitable, not only to Betsy and me, but to our four children at their home in Cambridge, Massachusetts. A distinguished scholar, the author or editor of more than 10 books, and an international leader in the field of mediation and conflict resolution, perhaps his most significant qualities in a world woefully short of them is that he is a kind and a principled person. What I share with Bob and what I also share with Rabbi Ellenson is one thing. All three of us married well above our station. <laughs> David Ellenson clearly needs no introduction, but that is no reason to leave him unscathed. His interim presidency of Hebrew Union College following a lengthy incumbency is a consequence of his characteristically generous willingness to assume this current role after the tragic death of Aaron Pankin. This interim responsibility will conclude on April 1. What significance one should draw from the date of April 1 is for each listener to decide. <laughs> David and Jackie are cherished friends of Betsy's and mine. For many years, when David tires of substantive conversation, cerebral reflection, and biblical research, he can always count on me for something vapid and useless. <laughs> Some months ago, with my hopeless attempt at humor, I magnanimously emailed David about my possible candidacy to become the new president of the college. <laughs> After less than 30 seconds of careful consideration of that opportunity, David emailed back and I quote, you need have no worry about seeming self-serving or overqualified. The community has already told me that the brightness of your being has blinded them. And their one fear is that should you accept the post, the rays from your person might well overwhelm all persons with whom you would be in contact. Something like Yahweh speaking to Moses. No one shall see my face and live. While there is universal recognition of your talents, the committee may not be able to select you, but we shall see. End of quote. And indeed, we have seen. <laughs> David Ellenson is a wonderful person. And I join all of you in looking forward to Robert Manukin's presentation and David Ellenson's reflections on it and response to it. Thank you. Well, I'm so grateful to be here. Uh, for, a, I think it's probably five fifth generation reform Jew. Uh, coming to Cincinnati and this place uh, is akin to a Catholic going to the Vatican. And it's thrilling to be back in Cincinnati. And I'm so grateful to Paul and Betsy and for Rabbi Zola to make it uh, possible. Uh, tonight, what I'd like to do is talk a bit about my book. And it's about the puzzling nature of Jewish identity in America and the challenges that I see facing the American Jewish community. In the next few minutes, what I'd like to do is share a couple stories. Uh, and the first, I think, illustrates the notions of identity and being Jewish are quite slippery terms. My first story involves the paradoxical life story of one of the world's most influential theorists 
on the subject of identity, Eric Erickson. I first met Erickson in 1975. At the time, he had already retired as a Harvard professor, and is with, with his wife, Joan, he had moved to Marin County, California. And I was fortunate enough as a young academic to be invited to be part of an interdisciplinary group of about 12 professionals who met with Erickson about half a dozen times, once a month. Uh, most of these other professionals were psychoanalysts, psychologists, psychiatrists, and they were considerably older and much, much more distinguished than I was. I was in my early 30s. And at the time, I was a professor at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, with interdisciplinary interests, where my focus had been essentially on family law and children in the law. <clears throat> I leapt at the opportunity to join this distinguished group and learn more about identity and human development from Erickson. When I'd been a student at Harvard a decade earlier, Erickson had been a real faculty celebrity. I never met him in Cambridge, nor did I take any courses from him, but many of my friends had. He'd been trained in Vienna as a child psychoanalyst by the Freuds themselves, primarily Anna Freud, but also to some degree he was involved with Sigmund Freud. At Harvard, he was a professor of human development and a lecturer in psychiatry. His perpetually oversubscribed undergraduate course called Social Sciences 139, The Human Life Cycle. It was extremely popular and known for being very interesting and at the time not terribly demanding. Erickson's worldwide influence sprang from his developmental model of identity, which posited that we work through particular challenges over eight life stages. Freud's original theory of development had not really extended past the years of early childhood. Erickson coined the concept of an identity crisis, which related to an adolescent struggle to develop a strong and cohesive sense of self. He had written best-selling biographies of Martin Luther and Gandhi, and he had in a sense helped establish the genre of something called psychobiography. Young Man Luther and Gandhi's Truth both championed the idea of psychohistory. The latter, by the way, won the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award, rare feats for a book by a mental health professional. Now, I immediately took a liking to Erickson. At 72, he was a very handsome man with blue eyes, a light ruddish complexion, and a striking mane of beautiful white hair. Although courtly, he dressed informally, like my grandfather, George Sittenfeld, our shared grandfather. He wore a Western string tie with a striking piece of jewelry as a clasp. Soft-spoken, he had an accent that sounded German to me, but from his name and appearance, I assumed he was Scandinavian. On one occasion, Dale and I had been invited to a small dinner party with the Ericsons. Dale was seated next to Erickson, and early in the evening, he asked her, what kind of name is Manukin? When she told him that the name came from a Hebrew word, Manucha, meaning at rest or peaceful, he asked Dale, are you Jewish? Dale replied that she was, and he said, you don't look Jewish. <laughs> then as if to explain his questions, he said with apparent modesty, I write about identity, you know. What neither of us knew at the time was the importance Erickson himself attached to not looking Jewish and not having a Jewish name. We found that out by chance only a short time after this dinner party when Erickson suffered an embarrassing crisis related to his own complicated and confused identity. The crisis was triggered by a New York Times book review with the provocative title, Eric Erickson, the man who invented himself. This front page story in the March 30, 1975 Sunday book review section 
included a beautiful photograph of Erickson with his magnificent head of white hair. It was written by Marshall Berman, a City College professor and a Harvard PhD who had studied with Erickson. And the review was of Erickson's most recent book called Life's, Life History and the Historical Moment, a collection of essays, most of which had been published previously individually. The first paragraph of the review could not have been more complimentary. Quote, Eric Erickson is probably the closest thing to an intellectual hero in American culture today. Several paragraphs later, Berman revealed what for me was a complete surprise. Quote, like many of the outstanding intellectuals of our time, Erickson grew up as a Jew in Imperial and Weimar Germany and crossed the water to America during the Hitler years to fill a vital inner need, to abandon his Jewish and German refugee status and reinvent himself as a man of Danish Gentile ancestry. Berman's harshest criticisms focused on what Erickson had omitted from an autobiographical essay in the book entitled Identity Crisis and Autobiographic Perspective. In that essay, according to Berman, quote, Erickson's bad faith is not hard to find. As evidence of bad faith, Berman mentioned four things. First, that Erickson, in Berman's words, quote, cannot bear to say that he's a Jew. In his essay, Erickson had acknowledged that his stepfather, Dr. Theodore Hamburger, was Jewish, and that Erickson had been raised as a Jew. But Erickson had failed to state that his mother, nay, Carlin Abramson, was Jewish too. No one knew, and to this day no one knows, who Erickson's father was. Second, that Erickson had changed his surname as an adult, having grown up with Hamburger's name and having been raised in his household. The name change according to Berman, represented Erickson's repudiation of his stepfather, whose Jewish name he should normally bear. Third, that the new surname Erickson had chosen was not his father's birth name, but rather a name he'd made up, drawing on his own first name. Berman noted, quote, the cosmic chutzpah of his claim to be Eric Erickson, his own father, in the most literal sense, a self-made man. Fourth and finally, Erickson didn't admit that he'd been a refugee, <clears throat> a victim of Nazism. In the essay, Erickson had asserted that he'd come to America voluntarily, not because, quote, in Berman's words, as a Jew, he had to go. The review did more than accuse Erickson of dishonesty about his Jewish heritage. It suggested that in evading or denying his Jewishness, Erickson was inauthentic and had lived his life inconsistently with his own developmental theories. <clears throat> Shortly after the review appeared, the seminar met for what I think was the last time. Erickson himself was not present. I suspect he was embarrassed and shaken by the review. The rest of us, many of whom were Jewish, were stunned by the intensity of Berman's attack. We discussed what, if anything, members of the group might do individually or collectively to show support for Erickson. The consensus was that whatever the underlying facts, Berman had unfairly attacked Erickson's character. Should a letter be sent to the Times in his defense? If so, what should it say? What we did not discuss in this group were the issues relating to Jewish identity that arose, at least for me, from Berman's review. Berman seemed to assume that the way to determine whether someone was Jewish was to apply the matrilineal principle of Jewish law. Erickson's mother was Jewish, therefore Erickson was Jewish. But did that mean he had to be Jewish forever? Was his biological father's background of no relevance? Was Erickson not allowed to forge his own identity? Moreover, I wondered, had Erickson converted to Christianity? And if so, shouldn't that be relevant to his identity as a Jew? Like others in our group, I was unwilling to criticize Erickson. I wished to have more facts. My guess was that Erickson no longer thought of himself as Jewish, and because of anti-Semitism, was reluctant to be publicly identified as a Jew. But no one in our group, myself included, posed the most troubling question raised by the Berman Review. Was this man we liked and admired, this man dedicated to, dedicated to identity and wholeness, a self-hating Jew? 
I was raised to believe that it was wrong to try to pass as a Gentile. But when I think about Erickson, I wonder, is it always wrong? What if a person feels no connection to Judaism as a religion or to the Jewish community? What if the burdens of anti-Semitism become unbearable, as they may have been for Erickson growing up in Europe? Why should it be wrong to stop identifying yourself to others as Jewish under such circumstances? In other words, why shouldn't you be allowed to opt out? Questions like these now, some 40 years after my encounter with Erickson, encouraged me to study in more detail Erickson's story and the various strands of his identity as an entry point into my own grappling with what it means to be Jewish. <clears throat> in doing so, I hope to expose the unsatisfying way in which American Jews today often categorize and pigeonhole each other. <clears throat> the second seed for my project was planted in a family dinner table conversation in Oxford, England. When my daughters forced me to confront the puzzling question of who counts as Jewish and my own ambivalence. I was spending a sabbatical semester in Oxford, England with my family. My wife, Dale, and I had enrolled our two daughters, Jennifer, then 11, and Allison, eight, in English schools. Over dinner one night at the start of the school year, Jennifer told us about her new class, RE, Religious Education, taught by Miss K, the formidable headmistress. Jennifer reported that Miss K began the class by asking, who here is of the Anglican faith? Nearly all the girls, according to Jennifer, raised their hands. Miss K then asked, who was Presbyterian, Catholic, even Baptist? A few more hands went up for each. Finally, Ms. K turned to the class and asked, is anyone here not of the Christian faith? I asked Jennifer, what happened next? Well, I raised my hand, and Ms. K asked, and what are you, my dear? I told her, Jennifer said, I'm Jewish. Ms. K paused for a second and said, oh, how interesting. <laughs> then she asked whether in Jennifer's words, my parents would object if, if as part of the course, we read parts of the New Testament as well as the Old Testament. I told her you would not object. Well, Dale and I told Jennifer that she had responded quite appropriately. Trying to be psychologically sensitive, I then asked, well, how did you feel about all of this? <laughs> Jennifer looked hard at Dale and me and asked, when are we going to become Jewish? Dale and I were a little stunned. I responded slightly defensively. Your mother and I have always thought of ourselves as Jewish. We're not really religious, but we are Jewish. Implicit in Jennifer's challenge was what it does it mean to be Jewish? Who should count as a Jew? Left unsaid, but implicit in my response was the idea I had grown up with. Being Jewish was not a thing you needed to choose to become. You just were, whether you liked it or not. By birth, Dale and I were Jews, therefore so was Jennifer. Descent alone was enough. One thesis of my book is that for my grandchildren's generation, this will no longer be true. To her credit, Jennifer was not satisfied with my response to when will we become Jewish. She shot back, you know what I mean. <laughs> It's a little embarrassing. It's Eric Erickson. Exactly, <laughs> calling me from on high. You know what I mean. And I said, I'm not sure I do know what you mean. I want to have a bat mitzvah. Dale and I looked at each other baffled. Where had this idea come from? Not from us. Neither Dale and I had ever been bar or bat mitzvahed. We had grown up in the Midwest in the 1950s in highly assimilated families. Our parents and grandparents were longtime members of Reformed Jewish congregations, which at the time, at least in Kansas City, and I think much of the Midwest, did not even celebrate bar or bat mitzvahs. No Hebrew school for us. Instead, like our Protestant friends, we'd been sent to Sunday school at our temple until 10th grade when we were confirmed. 
Twice a year, our parents took us to services on the high holy days of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. We received presents for both Hanukkah and Christmas, the latter celebrated as a secular holiday with gifts under a Christmas tree. Upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> to that point in our children's lives, we had done even less in terms of providing a religious education. We had not bothered to join any congregation, even after the children had, were born. Neither of us had felt any urge to become observant. And unlike the Midwest during the 1950s, we felt no community pressure to join a synagogue or temple. The spirit of the 50s, at least in Kansas City, was well captured by Will Herberg in the book Protestant Catholic Jew. You had to belong to one of the three teams. And I remember going to college and meeting Jewish kids from New York whose parents didn't belong to any congregation at all. And I, in Kansas City, they didn't exist. I mean, you had to belong. It didn't mean you had to be religious, though. In all events, one of the four challenges that I identify in my book, Facing the American Jewish Community, is that our commitment to Judaism as a religion for many is thin. While the overwhelming majority of American Jews today report that they take pride in being Jewish, with the exception of the Orthodox, we American Jews are less observant than our Christian neighbors, at least if measured by attendance at religious services or membership in a church or synagogue. Many Jews are not believers. Nearly half of Pew's respondents say they are agnostic or do not believe in God at all. 22% uh, of those who identify themselves as Jewish also reported they have no religion, what Pew called Jews without Judaism. These were people that said they took pride in being Jewish, but they had no religion. That figure, um, is said, balloons to almost a third among millennials. Let me turn to what I see as the second challenge facing the American Jewish community. My second story is about the youngest of my four grandchildren, Eli Alcott. The name on his birth certificate is Cornelius Alcott VI. With our enthusiastic blessing, our daughter Allison married a wonderful young man, Corey Alcott, whose real name is Cornelius Alcott V. Needless to say, Corey was not raised in the Jewish faith. This was not a big deal to Dale or me, nor were the Alcotts concerned that Allison was Jewish. That Allison married someone who is not Jewish is hardly exceptional. Today, among American Jews, as people in this room surely know, intermarriage is the norm, not the exception. The statistics are stunning. Since the year 2000, 57% of American Jews who married wed non-Jews. If you put aside the 10% of American Jews who are Orthodox, the number is 70%. Now this represents a stunning change. Traditional Jewish law prohibited intermarriage, and indeed among observant Jews, they would sit shiva, say the prayer for the dead if someone married outside the faith. In my grandparents' generation, intermarriage for Jews was exceedingly rare. The estimates are that it was about 2% in the first decade of the 20th century. Steady and now, there's been steady and now explosive growth. In my parents' generation, intermarriage was unusual. In our generation, it was becoming much more common, but was still the exception. For our children, even more now, intermarriage is the norm. Now, many Jews believe intermarriage is the greatest threat to American Jewish continuity and survival. Until recently, Jewish American leaders, including nearly all rabbis, focused discussions on how to prevent or discourage intermarriage. I disagree with this approach. Well, I think parents should be absolutely free to encourage their children one way or another. Uh, I think it's a foolish general strategy and that it's doomed to fail and will often be counterproductive. To my mind, the issue is not how do we stop intermarriage. It's what are we doing to engage the next generation. The challenge is how to best welcome and integrate these families into the American Jewish community. And most importantly, how to nourish a Jewish identity in their children. In the reform movement today, it's my impression, and I'm happy to report, that most reform congregations today enthusiastically try to encourage intermarried families to join their congregation and become part of Jewish life, whether or not the non-Jewish spouse 
uh, converts. Now, I think there are reasons to be optimistic. A recent study in Boston, for example, showed that over 60% of the children of mixed marriages were being raised as Jews, typically with the encouragement and support of the non-Jewish parent. In America today, thousands of children of mixed marriage are being raised as Jews with the support of their non-Jewish spouse. And I'm sure many of you here today uh, may have, probably identify yourself as Jewish, and may have a parent who's not. Now, I'm happy to report that our grandson, Eli Alcott, now 14, celebrated a year ago his bar mitzvah uh, this past spring. Now Eli is both his nickname and his Jewish name. But all my grandchildren are, of course, works in progress. And the a theme of my book that we can talk more about later is that I think the question is, who's going to choose to be Jewish? And I think this applies as much to young people today who have two Jewish parents as to those who have one Jewish parent. Let me say a few words about Israel, which I see as representing a third challenge. Uh, <clears throat> the 2013 Pew survey suggests that caring about Israel is an element of what most American Jews think being Jewish means. Support for Israel and a commitment to its survival have long contributed to American Jewish identity. I count myself among those who take pride and are very committed to the survival of Israel as a Jewish and democratic state. It was once thought that pride and support for the state of Israel would serve to unite a diverse Jewish community and to buttress Jewish identity in this country. Today, I fear the opposite is often becoming true. Certain present-day practices of the Israeli government now fuel intense conflicts among American Jews and reinforce deep divisions within the American Jewish community. At issue are two aspects of Israeli governmental policy. First, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the continued Israeli military occupation of the West Bank. And second, the exclusive role of the Orthodox rabbinate in defining for Israel what is authentic Judaism. Both are political issues that illustrate what I see as Israel's core challenge. Its core challenge is managing the tension between being Jewish and democratic in the face of serious security concerns. In recent years, the center of political gravity in Israel has shifted to the right on both these issues favoring increasingly ethno-nationalist and expansionary policies with respect to the West Bank and also the treatment of Palestinians. Because of the trends I identify in my book, my grandchildren will be more free than any previous generation to choose whether and how they are Jewish. I see the American Jewish community as a big tent with open flaps. And under this big tent are a remarkable variety of institutions, uh, religious and non-religious. Who should count as a Jew? I propose in my book, after some analysis, a two-pronged set of standards. My test for whether one is a Jew in terms of being under the big tent has a very simple test, public self-identification. If someone wants to publicly identify themselves as Jewish, I don't care whether their mother was Jewish or their father was Jewish or whether they've had a religious conversion. That's good enough for me. Under the big tent, however, uh, there are a variety of institutions. Some are religious, ranging from humanistic Judaism uh, to ultra-Orthodox, the Haredim, with reform, reconstructionist, conservative, broad spectrum. I am committed to the notion that these institutions, as well as institutions like Jewish film festivals, uh, Jewish federations, etc., they can set whatever standards they want for memberships for their particular organization or entity, but they can't impose their standard on the community as a whole. Uh, now, inside the Big Tent, the table is set with a smorgasbord of 
Jewish values, music, food, tradition, spirituality, language, philanthropic causes, connections with Israel. At this table, some will nibble, others will feast, but all will have options and none will be turned away. Under the Big Ten, of course, Jews must be encouraged to stay and to affirm our Jewish identity rather than lapsing into apathy. I think each of us has to answer the question, why do we care about being Jewish? And each of us, I think, must take responsibility for educating ourselves about our heritage and choosing what's meaningful to us and how we want to express it. In a very real sense, I think the chosen people must become a choosing people. At the end of the book, I answer the question, if asked by my grandchildren, what would I tell them is most important to me about my own Jewish identity? And I encapsulate it in terms of the Jewish head, the Jewish heart, and the Jewish heritage. By Jewish head, uh, what it means to me is that We've long been people of the book. Uh, we uh, relish uh, argument and debate and intellectual activities. We're not the only people in the world that so relish things, but it's been central to our religion and culture for a long, long time. Uh, by Jewish heart, what I mean uh, is what today is often characterized as tikkun olam. Uh, although my religious education at Temple B'nai Yehuda in Kansas City, Missouri was, as I say, painfully thin, what was, I think, imbued in me, in part through Sunday school, was a notion that we had an res individual responsibility to help make the world better, not simply but for Jews, but for people generally. Uh, and I did, I think... Uh, my cousin Paul Sittenfeld reflects this. If you look at the remarkable range of charitable and philanthropic activities he's, and civic activities he's been involved in. Go PG. <laughs> and, and finally, the third thing to me that I cherish and I have educated myself more on in order to write this book was the Jewish heritage. And by heritage, what I mean primarily is developing a deeper sense of this remarkable roughly 3,000 year old story, including the story, which is just stunningly interesting, of Jews in America, which of course this archive uh, does so much uh, to uh, provide a scholarly basis to study. Well, uh, that's, I think, a little bit about some of the themes in my uh, book, I, I am just absolutely thrilled that uh, Chancellor Ellison is going to comment, and I eagerly await your thoughts and reactions. Well, Dr. Ellenson, we have now moved you to the very front of the classroom. Uh, and uh, so, uh, also, I should mention that uh, we're streaming this live. None of you are, need to worry because you're not on the camera, but Dr. Ellenson is, Professor Manukin was, uh, I am now. So, uh, uh, Dr. Ellenson, the floor is yours. Uh, no sound. We can't. And here, you need the sound turned up, I think. Are you muted? No, I'm not. Working earlier, too. Let me see what's. I wonder if we bump something here. Hold on. Oh, it got bumped. Okay, okay there we go. Hey. We got turned on. Whoops, somehow. Okay. Now he's good. Dr. Again. Okay. Can you hear yep. me now? Yes. I thought maybe Professor Zola really didn't want to hear my words tonight. I wasn't, uh, wasn't sure. Uh, it is really a great, great honor and pleasure, uh, Robert, to be able to 
to respond to your work. And uh, what I would like to do, boy, I'm getting a lot of echo. I apologize for that. Uh, would be to offer several thoughts about your work tonight, uh, primarily from my perspective as both an historian and a uh, sociologist. Um, so let me really move ahead. And I do want to thank my friend Paul Sittenfeld for the very kind, uh, kind introduction. Uh, really a great honor for me to be with you. I am currently at sitting at Columbia Barnard Hillel, where I have another talk to give in a little while tonight. And I really am sorry and do wish that I could, uh, could be with you. Uh, let me try to set a larger context for uh, Professor Mnuchin's book. Uh, and I think what is crucial really right at the very outset is to know what it is that modernity has done to Judaism, namely the American story that Professor Mnuchin outlines has to be seen, I believe, against the larger story of emancipation uh, and enlightenment, namely with the onset of emancipation in Europe, and this was certainly true in the United States in the 19th century, uh, Jewish life was transformed. Uh, culturally, Jews came to learn ultimately more about non-Jewish culture than Jewish culture. If I were to begin suddenly to give this speech in Hebrew and not in uh, English, I'm gonna presume that most of you present would not understand. That is not meant to be a criticism. It is simply to observe that more Jews know more about non-Jewish culture than Jewish culture in the world in which we live. You begin to get these cultural changes religiously. Classical rabbinic Judaism rests upon the notion of a twofold revelation in Torah. Uh, even that which a veteran pupil one day recited before his rabbi, it was already revealed by God to Moses at Sinai. Most of us no longer believe that. If we believe that literally, in the divine revelation of written and oral law, um, we could not have reformed Judaism. As a boy, I grew up in an Orthodox background that I was required to often recite the lines, Reshi kol tzarich ladat shekola Torah kula, ben shebichtav, ben shebaalpeh, nidna melkadosh baruchu, the first thing you need to know is all of the Torah written and oral was given by God to Moses at Mount Sinai. It is impossible to change even a single jot or tittle, neither to be lenient nor stringent. In the world in which we live, Reform Judaism came and challenge these ideas, the notion of historical development. And quite frankly, most Jews, I know this will be shocking, uh, most Jews no longer believe that all of the halakha is divinely revealed. There actually are Jews who eat non-kosher food, who ride on Shabbat. Uh, I need to report all of this data to you tonight. Culturally and religiously, Jews begin to change. And politically, the modern nation state emerges. What this means is that the Jewish community, with the demise of corporatism in the 18th and 19th century, the Jewish community becomes voluntaristic. The French and American revolution become real revolution because at least in theory, authority is vested in the individual. And uh, while in classical rabbinic Judaism, in a setting where Jews had at least uh, the community semi-autonomous power, the community and the rabbi functioned as civil magistrates. In the world in which we live, rabbis at best have influential and not political authority. That is to say, I can tell each and every one of you, and I will, you are obligated as good Jews to give a gift to the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion. This will be my last fundraising pitch as president of the college. But the reality is I do not possess coercive legal sanctions at my disposal. I have to use at best influential authority, and that's contingent in all kinds of ways on the values that you've internalized as to whether or not you'll respond 
to such a claim? What begins to happen when Jews culturally know more about the larger culture in which they live, when religiously they no longer believe in the divinity of all of Jewish law, when politically they become individual citizens of modern nation states in every Western country where this has occurred in the 19th and 20th century, by the third generation after emancipation, Jews intermarry at a rate minimally of 33%. Jews in England, France, Germany, the United States, by the third generation after these changes begin to intermarry. If we look at America, and I go back to the... Uh, anecdotes that uh, and texts, quotations, uh, statistics that Professor Manukin cited. If you were to take my grandparents' generation who immigrated to the United States, in general, those people did not intermarry. By the 1940s and 50s, the rate of Jewish intermarriage in this country, the children of those immigrants' intermarriage was very, very low. By 1970, the third generation, grandparents had immigrated to this country. The rate of intermarriage reached about 30%. And by 1990, it was up to 50. And in the 2013 Pew study, 70% of non-Orthodox Jews marry people who were born non-Jewish. The Jewish community, as Professor Manukin points out, and I would just use different terminology to describe it, is simply no longer ethnically homogeneous. We have an ethnically and racially diverse community with which we live today. The question is, how will Judaism respond? By the way, as early as 1934, Mordecai Kaplan, the great founder of Reconstructionism, in his Judaism as a civilization, asserted that the great test of Judaism in an open society like the United States would be, would it in fact attract the non-Jewish partner and even more the children uh, of a Jewish and non-Jewish partner to Judaism. This would be the real test of Jewish civilization. So I think what we need to keep in mind is that these challenges that Professor Mnuchin has correctly pointed out confront Judaism as something that has an historical past, and we need to understand that the world in which we live today is radically different even than the world in which I lived uh, as a boy growing up in Newport News, Virginia in the 1950s and 1960. What all of this has meant, I think, and as I understand Professor Manukin's point, a correct one about Jews becoming a choosing as opposed to a chosen people, is that we have moved from traditional definitions of Judaism, that we have moved from a Judaism of boundaries, is the way I would describe it, to a Judaism of meaning. And the question is, what are the meanings that Judaism can provide in order to provide uh, for Jewish continuity and Jewish input in the lives of our children and grandchildren today? In terms of how it is that identity is determined, I would point out at least one significant element in this transformation. Uh, classical rabbinic Judaism, as Professor Manukin correctly points out by citing the matrilineal principle, has a status definition. That is to say, one is Jewish if one enters the world, I can say this, through a Jewish womb. If you were born of a Jewish mother, you are Jewish. It has nothing to do with voluntaristic affirmation whatsoever. The late Alvin Rhinus, our teacher at Hebrew Union College, said that Judaism, classical Judaism, possesses a birth dogma. The question is, is that appropriate today? How is it that identity is determined? Classical rabbinic Judaism had the notion, to quote the Talmud and Sanhedrin, Yisrael afa pishachata Yisrael hu. Even when a Jew sins or leaves the people, their status remains that of a Jew. But the issue of identity is radically different than status. First, as Professor Manukin points out, how does the self view oneself? How is it that each person regards him or herself? And clearly, uh, I would assert that that should become a paramount way in which we look at and regard 
Jewish identity in our day, but I am also aware that uh, identity isn't determined only by the self. The question becomes in part, how do people outside of the group view one? If your last name is Alcott, do people view you as Jewish or not? Or if your name were Rachel Levinson and you did not identify Jewishly, would people still see you as Jewish? And the answer might well be yes. And then finally, within the group, how is it that you would view and regard yourself? Certainly within the reform, reconstructionist, and renewal movements, we tend to have a very, very broad uh, swath of people whom we would consider Jewish. In the conservative movement, it is narrower. And in the orthodox movement, narrower yet. One of the most famous cases, and Professor Manukin discusses Brother Daniel and others in his book, but I would now mention the granddaughter of David Ben-Gurion, particularly in light of the point uh, that Professor Manukin made uh, about the hegemony that the Orthodox rabbinate enjoys in Israel. David Ben-Gurion's son fought for the British in World War II. He fell in love with his nurse. There was only one catch. She was Amos Ben-Gurion's fiance, was a Scottish Presbyterian woman. And she was converted to Judaism by a very, very well-known rabbi, Joachim Prinz. Uh, Michael Meyer has edited uh, some of Professor Prinz's work and it's been published through the HUC Press. Professor Prinz ultimately came to America where he spoke in 1963 uh, prior to Martin Luther King at the March on Washington, D.C. Professor Prinz performed the conversion. The Ben-Gurions went back to Israel and they had a beautiful granddaughter. From the standpoint of self, David Ben-Gurion's granddaughter grew up in Israel, spoke Hebrew, served in the Israeli Defense Forces, was the granddaughter of the prime minister of the Jewish state. She certainly viewed herself as Jewish. Non-Jews would have regarded her as Jewish. And everyone in the Jewish world outside of the Orthodox would have regarded her as Jewish. However, when it came time for her to be married, the Orthodox rabbinate said that her mother had been converted by uh, a non-Orthodox rabbi and therefore would not recognize her legitimacy as a Jew. And you had the irony that the granddaughter of the prime minister of Israel who had grown up in the Jewish state, nevertheless, had to undergo a formal ceremony of conversion in order to be married by the Orthodox rabbinate. I only point this out because I want to indicate how much dissonance there is between uh, dissonance between issues of status and identity and how complex the entire issue is when we talk about the matter of who is a Jew. Though I think that, Robert, your point was for us in the American Jewish community to really try to have a big tent and attempt to be as inclusive as possible. But one does need to note that uh, there is this kind of heterogeneity in our community today and pluralism. I'd also point out, and I'm speaking quickly because I want to have time for us to uh, have a bit of a dialogue and then to have questions from people in the audience, you do need to keep in mind that another major change in the American scene has been in order for any minority group like Jews to have a high rate of intermarriage from a sociological perspective, there need to be two variables present. Members of the minority group have to be thoroughly acculturated, thoroughly acculturated into the mores of the majority. If that does not occur, large numbers of the minority group will not uh, intermarry. But in addition to members of the minority group being highly acculturated, members of the majority culture have to view members of the minority group as highly desirable marriage partners. So there need to be two variables, both internal and external. Within the United States today, the two minority groups with the highest rates of intermarriage are Indian Hindus, namely Hindus from the Indian subcontinent, and American Jews. We two groups have the single highest rates of intermarriage. The question then, and here I agree completely with Professor Manukin, what should our policy be then? How do we 
welcome these families in here, I would argue, along with him, that there needs to be a policy of inclusion. Professor Manukin cited the study in Boston, where a large number, 66% of children in intermarriage identify as Jews. San Francisco has a comparable number. One should note that the federations in Boston, under Barry Schrage and then San Francisco, had policies of inclusion and welcoming for intermarried families. It seems to me that this is undoubtedly the way in which uh, our Jewish community needs to move. This needs to be the vector of our community today. And it will be, as Professor Kaplan, Rabbi Kaplan said, a test that will reflect on the uh, resiliency of our community. Let me conclude with just a couple of last thoughts. And here I would really invite Professor Manukin's uh, response. I heard your advice about the head, heart, and heritage as a way to respond to what these challenges are. But here I would mention uh, two books and studies to you. One, by a man whose work I am sure you know far better than I do, Ronald Dworkin. And I'd like to talk about Dworkin's book, Law's Empire. Dworkin, of course, was a very, very famous professor of law. And in his work, Law's Empire, he describes the nature of a legal system. And he compares it to an ongoing chain novel. And he says that each person in a legal system particularly appellate court judges and others, are required to display a degree of fidelity to the past. That is to say, the obligation of the judge, of the attorney, of those in the legal system, is to understand the values, precedents, principles, and policies that preceded one. And with an attempt to be faithful to what has gone on before, one then has to recognize that one's own responsibility is not obviated in the present. That is to say, one can take different courses and directions, but one is obligated to know what it is that has been said before if one wants to retain, this is a difficult word, authenticity. So the question that I would ask you, Bob, as you respond is, in terms of your response of head, heart, and heritage, and defining these things so broadly, how would you maintain a sense of authenticity to Dworkin's metaphor, if you were to apply it to Judaism, of ongoing authenticity uh, and vitality? And connected to that then, I would cite the work of uh, not Eric Erickson, but his son Kai Erickson. And I always think of his book, The Wayward Puritans. And what Erickson points out in the Wayward Puritans is it's a study of the Massachusetts Bay Colony in the 17th century. And what he argues in this book is that the rate of crime remains constant, though the substance of crime differs from decade to decade. And the sociological argument derived from Emil Durkheim that undergirds Kai Erickson, Eric Erickson's son point in the book the wayward Puritans, is that every society, in order to maintain its identity, has to engage in some process of boundary maintenance. Or another way to put it is, citing Durkheim, deviance is a healthy part of every society. Because from a sociological viewpoint, while deviance can't be defined in essentialistic terms, there needs to be a boundary in order for people in the group to understand where the boundaries are so that their own identity can be maintained. Namely, the argument that Kai Erickson puts forth out of a sociological tradition begun by Durkheim is that identity is formed over against the boundaries wherever they are. If you are a fan of the University of Cincinnati Bearcats, I presume you're not a fan of Xavier. If you go to Yale, then you don't go to, and you can fill it in, Harvard. If you teach at UCLA or root for UCLA, you don't go to USC. I could make a joke here, but I'll refrain from doing it. My question really, Bob, is to ask you, how would you answer them these questions of authenticity 
uh, and boundary maintenance that do seem necessary for a healthy society uh, and a healthy community like the Jewish one in light of your own call. And I agree with it for inclusion so that we have a Judaism of meaning and not of boundaries. And I thank you very much. And I hope that my remarks tonight have been uh, coherent. And I, again, want to indicate how very appreciative I am of your thoughts. And words. Your uh, comments are entirely coherent and I think uh, very well taken. First, about history. Uh, I've read the interview with you and some of your own writings on modernism, okay? And I couldn't agree more. And as you know, uh, in the book, I even, although I don't try to develop historically going way back, I spend a fair amount of time on American Jewish history. And I do put it against uh, the Jewish Enlightenment in the 18th century. And even yes, as you, absolutely. you and I agree that Spinoza is sort of the, in some ways, the font. Indeed, when the Times characterized my proposal as revolutionary, and in parentheses they said perhaps heretical, it pleased me that I may be one of the few Jews since Spinoza uh, that could be viewed as. Whoops, I missed you all now. Gary, I can't hear. OK, now I can hear. I was complimenting you on your scholarship, so it's important that you hear oh. it. Because I think it was Very think it's important terrific. I hear that. Just make sure your cousin, your cousin Paul hears it. That's all. I'm, I'm going to lecture him on it tonight. OK, uh, great. Uh, uh, I, I think, though, the also let me say a few words about identity, because in the, in the book I do, do talk about it. My own view of identity is that we all have many strands in our identity. If I ask you, who are you, and I asked you to list a number of things, you know, I, I, I would include uh, that I'm a father, a husband, a grandfather. I'm, I'm a law professor and a mediator interested in dispute resolution. Uh, I'm Jewish. I'm from Kansas City. Uh, uh, and there are a lot of other strands, too. But I think the salience of particular strands people have in their identity aren't fixed. I'm really against kind of uh, uh, identity essentialists that think people right. are one thing now and forever. Uh, and uh, second, I also, as you know from the book, completely agree with the notion is that although I suggest a test for the big tent of public self-identification, Identity is more complicated because it depends, particularly if you're identifying with a group. Do other members of that group think you're part of the group? That can affect your identity. And second, do people who are not members of the group, what do they think? Do they think you're a member of the group? Yeah. That, all of that adds complexity. Now, in terms of uh, your uh, notions of uh, uh, Dworkin and uh, Hyde Erickson, both of which I think are very interesting, let me say the following. What is obvious is I am not a professional Jew. I have not devoted my life to the study of halakha or the Talmud. And I, I am not, moreover, I am not trying to tell anybody how to be Jewish. I'm describing in the last chapter the head, heart, and heritage are for me what's meaningful. What I cherish about the American Jewish community is the extraordinary diversity and variety of that community. It's only as a Harvard Law professor that I've ever really gotten to know any Haredim. But Harvard Law School now admits some ultra-Orthodox kids who really don't have a college degree. They've just gone to a yeshiva. They've scored very high on the LSATs. And they're very interesting law students, because of course they've been studying law a long time. It's been a wonderful experience. They've been in my seminar as I was creating this book. And what thrilled me is they said they were learning something from what we were studying and what was in my book, because their own educations, in many ways, are extraordinarily narrow in terms of studying uh, history or culture. 
but they also know a great deal about a lot of things I don't know a lot about. I love that. I love the variety. And I guess I don't want a boundary. Look, at, I, I know the argument, you've got to set boundaries. And by the way, in a formal sense, my Big Ten standard does have a boundary. If you don't self-identify, you're not a Jew. Uh, and if you want to self-identify for the Big Ten, you are. That's a boundary. Now the question is, does that kind of definition have a sufficient tie to the halakhic heritage that it's going to be persuasive to those that are, feel bound by halakha? And the answer is no. On the other hand, what I like pointing out, this is a bit of a lawyer's argument, but I think it's an interesting argument. As I point out in my book, you know what the test was in Israel during the first 10 years of the state as to who qualified as a Jew for purpose of the law of return. There was no statutory definition. And the ministry in charge of immigration issued a regulation saying anyone who self-identifies is welcome. Indeed, there was a regulation that said there shall be no inquiry to sort of test whether they had a Jewish mother or anything else. You take their word for it. Now what happened around 1958 in Israel this, all hell broke loose with the Orthodox who opposed that, and ultimately it was changed to some degree. But I think it quite interesting that in the state of Israel, they had a definition akin to my Big Tent definition at a time, yes. of course, when they were trying to encourage people to come and help build the state. Well, I guess in a way, I think for the American Jewish community, we ought to have the same all-embracing, generous standard. And as I say, because I'm a liberal, under the Big Tent, if institutions under the Big Tent want to, in fact, have other boundaries, fine. They can do it for their own institutions. But I don't want them imposing it on the community as a whole. Anyway, that's what my argument is. And I guess uh, I, 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 I leave it to, I mean, I actually, as you know in the book, I devote a chapter to the matrilineal principle, right. and I re rely a lot on the scholarship of Shai Khan. And uh, you know what's 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 really interesting, of course, is 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 the biblical pedigree of the matrilineal principle, right. and the views of, 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 of many scholars does not exist, and many of the patriarchs had married women who were not part of the tribe. And no one suggests that their children weren't members of the tribe. And there was no process of formal conversion. Uh, uh, our, the matrilineal principle that we now apply, this, these issues of descent, were, in my view, a creation of rabbinic Judaism about the second century of the Common Era. And I think it was no doubt in response to some felt changes then. Uh, but um, I, I think we can, in the same way that the Reconstructionist movement and the Reform movement changed their definitions. I mean, I guess what I'm suggesting, at least for purposes of discussion, because most of all, I wanted to provoke a conversation uh, in our community that I, I think the operational standard for the community as a whole, for the big tent, ought to be, as I say, very broad. Thank you. Dr. Allen, can you hear me? Yes, I do. Okay. So I want to give everyone, uh, well, not everyone, but I'm going to open it up to uh, any questions that are pressing that people would like to ask. I'm also going to be a, a, a strict referee. We, we're going to end between 645 and 650, which is what I had promised. So uh, right now I'm vamping so that if there are questions, we can I can call upon them, and I want to just give you some instructions about the questions. So, uh, and then after we conclude, just so you know, uh, you, you're welcome to visit with Professor Manukin, and I understand that we have volumes. You can buy them and maybe even have them personalized. So, uh, Yeah, I just want to comment that Bob owes me a signature. Uh, on my you got it. Now, just a word about how to work the classroom. 
In front of you, there are, uh, nailed down so that no one takes it, uh, little microphones like this. And when it, I call upon you, all you need to do is press the button so that your light comes on, and then you can speak to the front of the room. So this is a high class room. You do not have to talk down here like that to be heard. You, you can just talk right at it and everyone can see you, all right? So with that introduction, is there any, are there any questions? Dean Friedman, if you please, press the, you gotta press and hold, it's down at the bottom, uh, where it says press. You gotta, you gotta keep your finger, there you go. Now, and then just talk. All right, uh, two things. One, uh, if David hears me, thanks for remembering, for, uh, for recommending the University of Cincinnati Bearcats. That's very nice of you to do so. Uh, my question is, so you also mentioned um, Jewish continuity. A lot of this Big Ten issues and the boundary issues has to do with Jewish continuity now in this century. Is there a new definition now? For some of us who have been involved in a good period of time, uh, Jewish continuity had a little more of a uh, uh, conservative uh, message. Is that, is that for Dr. Ellenson? <coughs> well, Dr. Ellenson? Well, the only part I didn't get, I appreciate what Dick said. I, I, I missed the question part of it. I know it's about Jewish continuity. Well, what he, he was asking if uh, that concept, which has been, correct me if I'm wrong, which has been so popular uh, in the late 90s and the beginning of the 21st century, no. is that, a, is that an, a topic that has a more conservative valence? That is the yes. idea of continuity. Yes, okay. I apologize. Yeah, I would argue that it does, and that's precisely why I frankly, and I hope none of my comments uh, would indicate otherwise, I frankly applaud this book, The Jewish American Paradox. I think that what Professor Manukin has done really quite well is to move us from the conversation of Jewish continuity in the way in which it was uh, framed in the 1990s to talking about how it is that we come to embrace choice in a changing world. The issue of Jewish continuity was tied up, I think, in some way with a rather narrow understanding of what uh, comprised Jewish continuity. I'm not opposed to that, and that's why I posed the questions that I did to Professor Manukin, at least in making my comments. But having said that, I do think the big tent approach is um, is, is really the much better one in our day. You know, there used to be lots of sociological studies demonstrating that, uh, you know, Jews who intermarried in the 60s and early 70s didn't raise their children as Jews. Well, when the Jewish community condemns such marriages as bad for Jewish continuity, why should it surprise one that the children of such marriages, the offspring chose not to be Jewish. Uh, I just don't think it was a very pragmatic policy for our community uh, to adopt during that, uh, during that period. Uh, I can see that Bob wants to make a couple of comments. Well, uh, first, I, I, I agree with what you're saying. And I think, let me say a word about the title of the book, The Jewish American Paradox. Uh, the paradox is, in my view, uh, in the 2,000 years of the diaspora, uh, there's never been a place like America where right. a Jewish minority has been so integrated into a society and so accepted. I mean, I just read a stunning set of statistics. Jewish Democrats now hold the gavel for the how are, are chairing the House Judiciary Committee, the House Appropriation Committee, the House Foreign Affairs Committee, the House Intelligence Committee, the House Budget Committee, the House Ethics Committee, committee. Uh, the, the minority leader in the Senate is a Jew. Uh, the Pew study, when it asked broad attitudes towards religion, guess what, the most recent one, Jew, the Jews and Judaism were the most admired faith you know, compared to other major religions. Now, 
Uh, and you can look at, of course, the economic statistics, the number of Supreme Court justices, Nobel laureates, all of this. Jews have achieved and are integrated in a remarkable way. Well, what's the paradox? The paradox is, in the American Jewish community, <clears throat> there is enormous anxiety about continuity. They were about to disappear. I don't think, in fact, notwithstanding the title of my Harvard co former colleague, Harvard colleague's book, uh, The Vanishing American Jew, uh, American Jews aren't about to vanish. Uh, what I'm more concerned about, uh, because f for sure, I think, in 50 years, I, I, my own prediction is two groups of Jews are still going to be around. They're going to be a group of very orthodox Jews, who I think are still going to be around, for sure. And there's probably going to be a group of uh, profoundly devoted Zionists who are still around. I'm very worried about a lot of the rest of us. You know, what's going to happen to our numbers? Because I think, in fact, the contributions to American society and to the, uh, and to the world of liberal American Jews has just been stunning. And it's something I take great pride in, and I'm optimistic about it. Uh, and I think what's great, as I said about this country, is religiously and non-religiously, people are expressing being Jewish in this remarkable variety of ways. So I remain optimistic. Uh, uh, but I, I wrote the book because ob obviously there are real uh, challenges. Yeah. Uh, Gary, just one more line. I mean, I, I completely agree with Bob. And here, I just want to underscore an individual who wasn't discussed tonight, but who Professor Manukin discusses in the book. I think the study by Lynn Sachs of Brandeis that uh, talks about the impact of rabbinic officiation at intermarriage and the degree to which couples in these cases identify Jewishly it is an important study that I think needs to be underscored in support of the viewpoint that Dr. Mnuchin, Professor Mnuchin puts forward. The other point is just an historical footnote. Marshall Sklar decades ago in American Judaism pointed out that America really was unique. The one real difference here is there is no medieval past. And Jews in America, by and large, with significant exceptions, have long been accepted. But it means that there's been an openness in American society that, uh, that has marked our people in this country and these shores from the 17th and 18th century all the way to the present day. And you, Gary, would certainly be able to talk on that with great authority. Okay. Uh... Oh, uh, Rabbi Gertel, if you would, and press the button, and sure. the light should come on. Well, and cool. uh, it, I'm going to call upon our scholars uh, if they can uh, answer tightly. Then uh, we can get to a question or two more. Go ahead. In, uh, for Dr. Manukin, to go back to your story about Eric Erickson and the group that met with him, I wonder what the decision was. Was there any effort at all? to reach out to him at that point in his life by people in the group or by anyone from the Jewish community that you know of. Uh, I mean, he did not self-identify, which was basic to your approach, but he certainly was identified or outed at that point. And, and what kind of outreach does your concept allow for? Uh, uh, I'm all for outreach, although I'm not in that business. Uh, there's a marvelous biography that I relied on of Erickson by a man named Friedman, uh, which I commend to you. And I also uh, draw on a number of sources, including uh, Bob Wallerstein, who was a psychoanalyst who, in fact, put this seminar together, was quite close to Erickson. And he wrote an essay after Erickson's death. I'm not sure if anyone in the group really uh, talked to him about it. I certainly didn't. I was, of course, 40 years his junior, and uh, at the time, I would have been too diffident to do so. OK. Uh, Lev, did you want to ask a question? Um, yes. As somebody who specializes in identity, something that I've been seeing coming up a lot, and it's, it's a question of, is it actually relevant? 
when someone identifies as a Jewish American or an American Jew, is that actually telling of something or is that just, you know, pedantic, uh, you know, which organization decides to use which one and, and such? Uh, that, that's an interesting question. Uh, and my title, of course, uh, says Jewish American. Uh, and I think it's because my focus really is, although I have a lot of discussion of Israel as well, and uh, some history that doesn't involve America, is really on America, and I think the challenges of our country. Uh, and I didn't mean anything more than that, but. So you would say that when you say Jewish American, it emphasizes the American, while American Jewish emphasizes the Jewish aspect, someone who emphasizes um, the Jewish aspect. I think aspect. that's fair. Okay. I think that's fair. And, and I think that for most American Jews, uh, they probably, I, I think the salience of their American identity is at least on a par with the salience of at least their commitment to formal Judaism. All right, we're gonna take one more question, and uh, but I'm gonna give a, a little plug to uh, the University of Cincinnati and the Hebrew Union College, because Lev, who just asked this question, I want everybody to know we now have a joint program in American Jewish history between the Hebrew Union College and the University of Cincinnati, and Lev, Rook's Rapport is uh, the first student in that program. Terrific. So we're, okay. So last question, and uh, then we'll bring the, uh, uh, the evening to get to a close. You gotta press uh, your button and hold it down. Oh, hold hold it, it, press and hold and speak, right. Um, Well, I, I think my own view is, I, I actually discuss, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the book, the question of boundaries. And uh, I, I think the idea that there could be a substantive definition of defining who counts for a Jew as a Jew uh, in America is an impossible task in the sense that there's no consensus. Uh, of, uh, uh, we obviously lack a pope, uh, and I think if, if in fact, if you ask for a standard that's going to be accepted by everybody, uh, it, it's, it's probably not going to happen. And that's why what I hope is that this idea of a two-pronged test that says to smaller groups, you can have whatever standard you want but don't try to impose it on everybody, that we should, in fact, uh, be more tolerant and accepting in terms of the Big Ten. Makes more sense, at least to me, in terms of the practical predicaments we face. Because I think that, in fact, in a world where actually the head of the Jewish Theological Seminary was a, a friend and a colleague at Stanford before he became the head of the, the other place, he said he, he can't get Orthodox rabbis to meet publicly with him uh, to discuss issues of theology with public audiences. All right? In that kind of world, I think the notion that, well, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna be able to reach kind of easy agreement isn't going to happen. And so uh, that's the reason. That's part of the reason, at least. Well, Fred's, uh, it says one, uh, seven, 652, we're going to, I'm going to bring this to a close. I will say I share your optimism. In fact, I, I often tell the rabbinical students that they shouldn't worry uh, about the growth of the uh, Orthodox community on the basis, I'm speaking now as a historian, on the basis of the history of the Jew in America, 
they can count on when they're my age that most of those people will be their congregants. And uh, so, uh, and that's, that's a, just an observation on the history of the Jew in America. So uh, I think, friends, we've had a wonderful and uh, informative and very uh, a fruitful evening. And I know you want to join me in thanking both Professor Manukin and Dr. Allenson. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for supporting our programs.